everyone. Glad to be here. Tonight I would like to share a vision that many of us have been holding since the early days of the digital revolution. This is the vision of a shift to a sustainable human civilization made possible by advanced use of information and communication technology, or as it's called in the industry, the term of art is ICT. The title of this talk is Designing the Control Panel for Spaceship Earth. And it is in part a recounting of my personal journey, which has informed my approach and contributions to this vision. It's also uh, in part a history of the digital media revolution. I was always interested in publishing and, commu and communications, <clears throat> realizing from early on that information and the access to it was essential to our cultural evolution. I was active in the early 1980s independent press movement up here in the Bay Area with my small publishing house, Avant Books. We were releasing environmental titles, including a biography on John Muir, the father of the environmental movement, uh, a collection of essays by leading environmental thinkers edited by Michael Tobias called Deep Ecology, and Arco Santi, a book about, by Paolo Soleri about his philosophy of ecological urban design. While our books did make their contributions to the culture, I grew discouraged with the limitations of what seemed an archaic publishing industry. In spite of the improvements in economical short-run printing, small press distribution, and um, the specialized journals that were distributed worldwide, the publishing world at the time offered extremely limited opportunities for new voices, not to mention new ideas. How convenient that the Macintosh arrived when it did in the mid-1980s serving soon thereafter as the cornerstone of the desktop publishing revolution, which was the first phase of the coming digital media tsunami wave. I recognized right away what the Mac's graphic user interface and its melding of text, graphics, photos, animation, and sound implied for the media fields. I experimented with digital fine art and soon launched one of the first desktop published magazines using the Mac powered by the PostScript graphics language with PageMaker software and the, at the time, wondrous Apple laser printer. This was the quarterly Verbum Journal of Personal Computer Aesthetics, which in its production served as a showcase of the fast-evolving publishing technology with content devoted to creative works in the new realm of digital media. This was the beginning of a remarkable decade of invention during which the standards and tools we now take for granted some 20 years later were created. Our cyber culture scene in San Francisco, and by the way, that term was originally strictly tongue in cheek, was made up largely of the early adopter creatives and the engineers who were collaborating in the development of the digital tool sets that would soon transform whole industries publishing, graphic design, animation, audio production, video production, and photography. We celebrated the democratization of media production tools and the opening of a decentralized world of networked information and communication. As the graphic, sound, and video technologies rapidly evolved, a whole new medium was emerging that integrated all of them and added a new dimension, interactive multimedia. Apple's HyperCard, which celebrated its 25th anniversary this month, introduced, a hyper, introduced hypertext to the world via an elegant, simple programming language that anyone, anyone could use to interconnect documents, files, and files through click, clickable hyperlinks. At the same time, early multimedia authoring programs inspired a lively community of digital designers, animators, video producers, and musicians to explore the new territory. Our Verbum team led the charge with a trailblazing CD-ROM, Verbum Interactive, the first multimedia magazine integrating animated interfaces, text with hyperlinks, music, video, and animations. We demoed a beta version of Verbum Interactive, by the way, at the second TED conference. 
Imbued with pre-millennium idealism, cyber, cyber culture gatherings at the time, such as Verba Magazine's Digital Be-In, held during January Macworld Expo in San Francisco every year, emphasize the humanistic dimension of this new media world. The graphic user interface and hypertext were instrumental in the birth of the World Wide Web, which sprung into existence with the 1993 launch of the Mosaic browser. The internet, until that time a network of networks providing only basic text and file exchange, suddenly came to life as a global matrix of interconnected nodes. Now hyperlinks instantly accessed graphic pages hosted on servers anywhere in the world, and online forums and email connect connected people globally as never before. Some at the time noticed that this open, self-organizing, distributed network was not unlike many designs found in the biological realm. Engineers and theorists alike began seeing the reflection of our evolving digital world in the mechanisms of nature's dis distributed networks, binary codes, memory, processing, and feedback loops. We also observed the phenomenon of Moore's Law, where we saw the doubling of processor power every 18 months a remarkably steady progression against the seemingly chaotic backdrop of changing standards, experimental products, setbacks and breakthroughs, mergers and acquisitions, and a largely unpredictable, rapidly changing marketplace. The organic, emergent quality of the web was undeniable. In the mid-1990s, having stayed in touch with architect philosopher Paolo Soleri, I joined the board of his Arcosani Model EcoCity project in Arizona. His approach to the built environment followed natural design principles for low-impact, regenerative eco-cities that he felt would not only create a sustainable civilization, <clears throat> but also open up new evolutionary directions for humanity. His ideas of an evolving human species drew inspiration from Teilhard de Chardin, the French philosopher Jesuit priest and paleontologist who popularized Vladimir Vernadsky's idea of the Noosphere, a collective sphere of human thought emerging from the biosphere. Soleri saw the, bio, the Noosphere as enabled by our telecommunications and digital technologies, as did others. Following this insight, I co-produced the Paradox Conferences at Arcosanti in 1997, 1999 and 2001, bringing together technology, environmental, and evolutionary thinkers, exploring how to deal with the paradox of a global consumer culture that required more resources than the planet had to offer. A primary theme there was the promise of our new digital technologies, that the new di digital technologies and the internet offered for the sustainability movement. One of the most compelling presentations was that of Janine Benyus, whose biomimicry concept of looking to nature for design solutions was resonant with Soleri's architecture meets ecology approach to urban design. Following the experience of the Paradox Conferences in 2002, I co-founded the Green Century Institute with Fort Mason director Mark Kasky and visionary philanthropist Henry Dakin as a clearinghouse of information on sustainable communities. In addition to holding regular topical events, we explored a proposed Northern California model eco-city called Califia that would begin its development through a specialized social network and collaborative planning process and theoretically be funded by Silicon Valley green tech concerns. We also began researching platforms for sustainable communities that would connect projects, provide topical forums and collaboration tools, grow a database of best practices, access expertise, resources and funding, aggregate frameworks and standards, and present real-time scorecards tracking sustainability initiatives. In the mid-2000s, more tools and platforms addressing sustainability started to emerge. Paul Hawkins' Wiser Earth came online and quickly became a global directory and community of over 100,000 NGOs and socially responsible organizations. 
In 2008, the United Nations Department of Economic and Social Affairs and the Commission on Sustainable Development sought our help in developing an internet-based information and collaboration platform for the hundreds of international groups and businesses they wanted to bring together under their 10-year framework for, de for developing sustainable consumption and production. Sustainable consumption and production is a major part of our global sustainable development. It doesn't exactly roll off the tongue, but uh, it's known as SCP, and it's a, a major area uh, uh, that needs to be developed. Technoverity was the name I gave this informal exploration with the UN groups that combined their vision of a catalyst for the sustainable consumption and production movement and ours for a sustainable community online nexus. The potential scope of the project grew through a series of exploratory meetings with technology integrators and tech concerns such as Google, Nokia, Hewlett Packard, Yahoo, and Cisco. The interest of these groups and potential sponsors waned in the wake of the economic collapse as corporations, governments, and the general public focused more on financial survival than investing in a sustainable future. But of course, we have continued our work, as have countless other groups, who know that while the current systems break down, the new systems must be built. Today, 2.2 billion people are connected online, nearly a third of Earth's population. Social media is changing how we relate to each other as individuals and groups, and we are in a struggle to keep the internet open while various forms of cyber warfare rage in the background. ICT is being used in countless ways already for sustainability initiatives across the world. There are myriad applications in use and new generations of tools and systems emerging. But something more wants to happen, something synergistic. The entire planet has now been mapped in detail, and we have increasingly comprehensive data on its massive systems and bioregions, as well as on our cities, buildings, transportation networks, energy systems, waste management, water flows, construction and manufacturing processes, and so on. We have new design and technology solutions for developing truly sustainable communities. We have the ability through social networking and online collaboration programs to share the best practices and engage, in commu and engage communities in complex dialogues and cooperative ventures. We have only scratched the surface of what is possible with crowdsourcing and cause-aligned gaming. New forms of digital identity, transaction mechanisms, and community currencies are being developed. Geospatial imaging and 3D simulations of natural and human-made processes give us unprecedented visualization tools. So, what is the next level here? Is not our growing newosphere meant for something more than e-commerce, dating sites, cat videos, and surveillance? Many think so. In fact, the idea of a meta-platform for sustainable culture or a new evolutionary network of networks has become a popular meme during the last few years, and there are many ambitious projects underway, although in most all cases, funding and ICT industry support is in short supply. How might such an Uber platform, or per perhaps better described, next generation web, be developed? Buckminster Fuller's comprehensive, anticipatory design science comes to mind. The idea of an interactive model of the Earth that would inform a planetary citizenry was originally conveyed by Bucky in a 1962 uh, invention he called the geoscope. In his words, the geoscope is a miniature Earth its entire exterior and interior surfaces will be covered with closely packed electric bulbs, each with variable intensity controls. The lighting of the bulbs is scanningly controlled through an electric computer. It will make possible communication of phenomena that are not at present communicable to man's conceptual understanding. The consequences of various world plans could be computed and projected. All world data would be dynamically viewable and picturable and relayable by radio, 
so that common consideration in a most educated manner of all world problems by all world people would become a practical event. That's Bucky, 1962. What a guy. So I certainly have no grand design for today's geoscope, but to borrow another Bucky analogy, I am convinced it is an evolutionary imperative that we build the collective equivalent of a control panel for Spaceship Earth so that we can move beyond our adolescence as a species and live up to our role as stewards of this living planet and participants in the galactic ecology of living worlds. I believe that through our ICT-enabled newosphere, we are meant to achieve a common understanding of the whole system in which we are embedded and to align our evolutionary intentions on a mass scale. If we co-create a coherent vision of our species' evolution and act on this vision, nature will support us. Many more will experience that sense of flow and those synchronicities that indicate we are participating in something meaningful and greater than ourselves. It's much more fun and rewarding to participate in our evolution than to sit on the sidelines. On a final note, the Technoverde Initiative lives on. It is now a research project under the fiscal sponsorship of the Buckminster Fuller Institute. With offices in the David Brower Center in Berkeley, we are in the first phase of what we call the Global Shift Mapping Project. Our initial goal is to identify, profile, and connect ICT and sustainable culture resources. As one of our colleagues put it, we are creating some connective tissue in the newosphere. Practically speaking, we are mapping and profiling technology assets, global shift campaigns and media projects, individual leaders and experts, organizations and communities, financial resources, and finally, the vast open-ended category of thrivability resources, the growing universe of tools, products and services, expert bodies, programs, initiatives, and ventures, all contributing to the global shift and it's 2012. Thanks very much.